Hi, good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Pilar Prieto. I am a neuro-oncologist and neuroimmunologist at NYU. I am honored to be part of this survivorship seminar program. And I hope that the information that I provide is uh, helpful for you and your loved ones. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about uh, neurological complications in cancer survivorship. The talk is going to have two parts. The first part is I'm going to talk about neurological uh, conditions associated with cancer and cancer therapies. And the second part of the talk is, uh, is going to be focused on survivorship interventions for maintenance of function and quality of life. Uh, neurological conditions that can be associated with cancer and cancer therapies. Uh, we know that there's primary brain tumors that can affect uh, the neurological status of people. And, uh, and also uh, cancer you know, from different parts of the body that can go into the brain. Uh, we have patients that have radiation to the brain and that can cause thermic complications. Uh, many of our patients go to uh, uh, through chemotherapy and develop chemo brain. Autoimmune disorders that can affect their, the nervous system, such as paranoplastic syndromes, which are becoming uh, uh, better identified nowadays, and complications from immunotherapies, which are becoming also more frequent as we use more immunotherapies. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, which uh, Dr. Merc uh, uh, Mercado provided a really, really good uh, talk uh, uh, last year, and other complications. Uh, so primary brain tumors are metastasis. Uh, from the brain tumors, we have low-grade gliomas, high-grade gliomas, for most common ones, and to, but we have many others. And from the metastases, uh, they can go to the brain, they can go to the spine, uh, and they can also spread through the spinal fluid. The symptoms depend on where they affect in the nervous system. Uh, some patients can have headaches, seizures, weakness, sensory changes, loss of balance, memory difficulties, speech, and, uh, and many others. Uh, the treatment for some of these conditions can include surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which, and other newer medications. And from all these treatments and conditions, people can have memory deficits, uh, they can develop radiation necrosis, fatigue, neuro deficits, sensory changes, weakness, difficulty walking, um, vision changes, and so forth. So radiation treatment uh, complications usually presents with memory deficits, and we can also do you know, for these patients going to rehab. They can present with headaches, and uh, and the definition for radiation necrosis it's essentially a brain inflammation and swelling uh, that results from radiation therapy. Uh, it can be symptomatic or it can be asymptomatic. A lot of times we just see these on serial imaging for follow up of the metastasis. Uh, sometimes it can cause symptoms, seizures, headaches, memory uh, weakness, sensory changes, and um, and sometimes it's even some, it can be worse than the actual uh, metastasis itself. Uh, thankfully, we have uh, treatments that can help with the swelling and also some of the uh, process behind it, uh, which targets the abnormalities in the blood vessels, so the, the blo those blood vessels are not as leaky. Um, if that doesn't work, sometimes we can use laser ablation or remove that area that is causing problems. Uh, it's, the treatment is personalized, it's different in every patient, and uh, uh, but it's always uh, good to be aware that uh, with radiation therapy to the brain, that is a possibility. Some of these uh, complications with radiation can also be exacerbated by immunotherapies uh, like checkpoint inhibitors because they stimulate the immune system and it can make it it can increase inflammation. Uh, chemo brain uh, is a poorly understood condition, but it's very prevalent in people that undergo chemotherapy. Uh, most people complain of shortened memory, difficulty with word finding, reduced attention and span and concentration slow processing, difficulty multitasking, and these symptoms, which are vague and invisible to other people, uh, can lead to depression, uh, loss of job, uh, social withdrawal, affects the quality of life, and uh, uh, and, uh, and it can, uh, 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 I'm 
sorry, I can't hear the echo here. And we need to evaluate for these uh, symptoms and take them seriously. Uh, first of all, we need to make sure that they that they uh, the cause or the symptoms are not exacerbated or caused by depression and anxiety, lack of sleep, thyroid disease, hormonal imbalance, sleep disorders, uh, subseizure activity or medications. How can we cope with chemo brain? One of, one of the most important strategies is cognitive rehabilitation. This involves working with a therapist and neuropsychologist to improve memory, attention, and problem solving skills. Uh, some techniques that you can use, and depending on what you're struggling with, is keeping a diary, uh, uh, using the smartphone apps or reminder and alarms, um, make sure that you always keep the keys in the same place, make sure that you always have uh, uh, an organized lab as much as possible, and also it's, uh, it helps to keep like little post-its sometimes, so it depends on what you're struggling with. Very important is mindfulness and stress management. Uh, when we are overwhelmed, uh, our brain is running in in, um, in crisis mode, and something you know, when it runs in crisis mode for a long time, it's difficult to keep that level of focus. So taking a, taking a step back, taking breaks uh, intermittently, five minute break in between hours, or ten minute break walking around, uh, that helps uh, clearing the mind as well. Breathing exercises also help uh, significantly. Keeping a healthy lifestyle, having a balanced diet, the only diet that has been proven to have some impact in the cognitive uh, function of people is the Mediterranean diet um, and, uh, and physical exercise, which I, I'm going to talk a little more about later. Medication management. Always talk to your doctor and your pharmacist about the medications you're taking. Sometimes um, we are taking too many medications and uh, or if you're being seen by multiple physicians, that list just keeps adding up. So it's always good to take a moment and have a conversation with your team to see if you really need some of those medications. And, uh, and you'll be surprised. Sometimes we are able to peel off some of those medications as well. Uh, also, sometimes it depends on the situation and your risk and, and potential side effects. Uh, there are some medications that can help. It's not a magic pill, but they can support all the strategies that I mentioned earlier. Now, I'm going to go over autoimmune disorders that affect the nervous system. It, in normal circumstances, our immune system detects and kills the de defective can uh, cells that reproduce abnormally. And that's in the way that our body is supposed to work. In cancer, those cancer cells disguise as friends, and then our immune system cannot detect it as abnormal. So they just uh, pass by, and these cells start multiplying um, as you know, as they as they start growing a tumor. Paraplastic syndromes is an immune response. Uh, it's a response from immune system uh, to the cancer cells. But instead of trying to to attack the cancer cells, it gets confused and attacks our own body. Uh, complications from immunotherapies, our immune system is really excited, it's ready to fight, and then it gets confused and um, and targets our own body uh, instead of just targeting the cancer cells. They can present in a similar way, they share some of the uh, symptoms and also the treatment, but they're, they, they, um, they're different overall. So complications from immunotherapies, some of the immunotherapies that are most commonly used are pembrolizumab, nivolumab, ipilimumab, um, and CAR T cells, which is one of the most novel therapies. And the in a session for CAR T cells, which the neurological symptoms, if they happen, happen immediately, the, the more common immunotherapies can occur at any time during treatment, sometimes after the first dose, sometimes after the ninth of those. Not very common that they happen after nine doses, but it's not unheard of. Uh, the nice thing about it is that these, these conditions respond nicely to steroids, and the earlier is recognized and treated, the better outcome is. The faster you get better, and the higher chances of a full recovery you have. Depending on the severity of these uh, conditions, 
your doctor may need to pause or stop completely the treatment because of a risk of a relapse or uh, causing further damage to your nervous system. Uh, if you have a prior autoimmune condition, the risk of developing a, um, an autoimmune condition from an immunotherapy is higher. So always discuss this with your uh, oncologist and, um, and always be alert of any potential changes that you may experience, call your neuro-oncologist quickly. Some of the neurological manifestations are uh, encephalitis, which is essentially brain inflammation. It can present with confusion, seizures, weakness, sensory changes, um, transverse myelitis, which is inflammation of the spinal cord. Uh, it can cause weakness, sensory difficult changes, bladder and bowel control issues. Optic neuritis is inflammation of the optic nerve, so you can have uh, either uh, blurred vision on, well, you can have blurred vision or complete loss of vision in one eye or both. It, uh, it, can, it can present with or without pain on eye movement. If you notice any vision changes, uh, uh, you know, call your doctor immediately because that's, you know, we only got two eyes, so we don't have a lot of time to, uh, to react to give you steroids and make sure that you don't lose any vision. I mean, with every, anything neurological, but especially the eyes. Autoimmune conditions, I'm, I'm sorry, autonomic dysfunction uh, uh, involves changes in the, uh, in the ability of the body to regulate blood pressure, heart rate, sweating, uh, salivation, bladder control, even sometimes the sensory uh, changes in, in the hands or feet, and, uh, and the, the function of the very small capillaries in the body. Uh, also gut mobility. So uh, if you start noticing any changes that, you know, you feel very dizzy or you pass out when you stand up or you have um, more difficulty, uh, you know, digesting food, it stays longer in your stomach or any questions that you may have, just contact your doctor. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, tingling, numbness, and pain. This can be on top of whatever, whatever uh, any prior peripheral neuropathy from chemotherapy that you may have or from diabetes. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is a um, neurological condition that starts with ascending muscle paralysis. Sometimes it starts with even not, like tingling sensation. It starts on the toes and then it just climbs up back to the body. If not detected in treatment on time, it can lead to complete paralysis, including the diaphragm, so people end up being on a ventilator. Um, if detected on time, uh, you know, treatment can be, can be given. If, if this is a pure Guillain-Barre or uh, syndrome, the, the treatment is a little bit different uh, than with, than with uh, than if it is triggered by immunotherapy. Uh, if it is triggered by immunotherapy, it responds beautifully to steroids. But don't worry about that. Your neurologist uh, will know how to manage it. My Gravis gravis uh, is, is a syndrome that causes fa uh, progressive fatigability of the muscles. So people may have droopy eyelids, double vision towards the end of the day, or you know they cannot hold their arms up as long as as long as they used to do in their hair. You know they start kind of just dropping, uh, or they're unable to keep up with the stairs as they did before because their legs are really weak, um, and then rest for a little bit and they're back to back to normal or better. Uh, so if you notice any of these, please call your your doctor and ask for a referral to neurology. And Hashimoto's encephalitis. This is um, an inflammation of the brain that is triggered by inflammation, in, uh, inflammatory or autoimmune disease to the thyroid. It can happen on people that are that um, that are on or or not on immunotherapies, and uh, and it can present with inf with confusion, seizures, uh, changes in personality as well, and also you know, other autoimmune diseases that can uh, be triggered that sometimes can have some neurological symptoms, include lupus, uh, uh, Sjogren's, uh, myositis, and rheumatoid arthritis it, you know, can cause some, uh, some nerve pain if it is compressing some of the nerve roots from inflammation. Um, now, panoplastic syndromes. Uh, these syndromes can affect any part of the nervous system, and they're typically uh, grouped in certain syndromes because of they have these stereotyped clinical manifestations. 
uh, they can precede cancer diagnosis by two to three years, but also it can present at the time of diagnosis or during the cancer treatment or uh, surveillance, indicating that there might be a relapse. Um, this can, these symptoms can affect one out of 300 patients with cancer, oftentimes because underdiagnosed or underreported, because these are syndromes that are difficult, you know, start like very vague and they're difficult to detect. And there's, you know, there's increasing awareness about the syndromes uh, across the board, but it's not enough yet. But but we're getting better, which is good. We're spreading the word. And uh, and a very important point to make is that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So a lot of other symptoms, but many other conditions, neurological and some of them not neurological, uh, just keeping a high level of awareness and having a very open co uh, communication with your team is very important. I'm not going to go in very detail in great detail about this table, uh, but I just wanted to show that you know these paraneoplastic syndromes uh, can affect different areas in the brain. Uh, they have a specific antibodies um, and um, that are associated with specific locations in the brain. And you know, and this serves also kind of understanding you know, what what they uh, you know, what to expect with some of these. But you need to remember this. This is for your doctors. The most common syndromes that we see uh, that are autoimmune uh, uh, or paraneoplastic syndromes is uh, limbic encephalitis, which starts with psychiatric symptoms, seizures, memory changes, movement abnormalities. Um, of Oxaconus myoclonus is a uh, rapid involuntary eye movement it's like all erratic eye movements you know, people look to the left and the eyes just uh, wiggle all over the place some people may not have issues with the vision and some people may see that the whole world jumps um, this is also associated with uh, myoclonus which is uh, abnormal movements of, uh, of the limbs it can affect gait it can affect um, uh, your, your coordination as well uh, Stiff person syndrome is a generalized muscle stiffness and spasms, and um, and it can be associated with or without cancer as well. Cerebellar degeneration affects the coordination, the balance, poor fine motor control, sometimes can cause some emotional uh, liability. You know, it's easy to cry and and and, and laugh within the same minute. Uh, rapid progressive dementia is an accelerated cognitive dysfunction within two to three months. It's like very marked. Like almost every week you lose a, um, an important ability. Uh, it's important to recognize this because um, sometimes it can be mislabeled as, as Alzheimer's and um, and there might be something uh, something else that meets the, the eyes. Um, and, and automatic, uh, I'm sorry, autonomic dysfunction, uh, which can present as um, gastroparesis, heart rate, and blood pressure issues, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is a table of uh, um, some of the cancer association with, depend with the different um, um, antibodies. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go over the whole table, or it will take like three days. But, uh, but you know, it's going to be available on YouTube, so you can look into this. If you have any of these um, uh, conditions like breast cancer, lymphoma, um, breast, lung cancer, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, conditions, you, know, you might be at higher risk, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get them. So uh, if you don't have any symptoms, there's no, no need to, to worry much about. Encephalitis is, uh, as I mentioned, patients can have hallucinations, they can become obsessive cons compulsive, uh, they can have delusions, severe mood changes. Uh, Patients can have seizures, uh, rapid and, mem and memory loss, cognitive changes. Um, they tend to have an abnormal MRI, which I'm going to show in a moment. Uh, most of the time, we find antibodies either in the blood or in the spinal fluid. And, uh, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion, but also we, have, we need to have like a high level of suspicion. So some of these uh, syndromes can be associated with cancer. Uh, one big exception is uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis, which uh, presents in typically in, in young girls or young women that have an ovarian uh, teratoma, which is a, a benign tumor essentially of the ovaries. Once removed, the condition is cleared. 
uh, a, a very nice uh, self, uh, or like a memoir uh, from a patient that experienced this condition uh, is Brain on Fire. They have the book and they have the 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 movie and it can it can show you how devastating some of these presentations can be uh, she was uh, she was successfully treated and she was able to go back to her previous job so these are depending on the kind of encephalitis and the antibody that is affecting you uh, you can have uh, different types of presentations so this is an what a normal brain mri looks we like to see a different shade of gray in grays. Uh, you know, here the colors are inverted, but we can see the cortex nicely and the and the white matter here nicely as well. These are the ventricles where the spinal fluid is created. And here we can see all the white areas that are uh, that have the arrow sign are uh, areas where you know there's abnormalities. So here's like limbic encephalitis. Here we have a GABA A receptor encephalitis. This is a um, um, uh, different kinds of encephalitis, I believe LG1. So there's many different kinds of presentations and depending where they affect, the symptoms are uh, uh, show up. The recovery, so it's tailored to the, to the personal need. It's multidisciplinary. It involves rehabilitation, uh, physical occupation and cognitive and speech. So it's a whole, like uh, uh, a holistic approach essentially. Uh, it involves oncology, psychiatry, neurology, internal medicine, neuro oncology, neuromonology teams, and the, and the earliest is recognized, the, the earliest rehabilitation efforts are initiated, the better recovery. But it's important to have a lot of patience because the recovery can take up to two years, uh, sometimes months or two, or two to three years to have a meaningful recovery. And you know, in the beginning or in the middle of it, you know, it's very easy to become discouraged and, and just give up. Um, but you know, if we see a little bit of improvement, you know, there's still hope. Um, so the person can look really, really sick in the beginning, but eventually they come off the ventilator, they're able to rehabilitate and they're able to uh, have a more meaningful life, uh, but it, takes, it, takes a, it can take a long time. Uh, GAT65, which is uh, the antibody most commonly known for stiff person syndrome, it can also cause some, cause some encephalitis. Um, when it causes a stiff person syndrome, it can respond to benzodiazepines. Uh, and in this condition, it's very interesting because the muscles, you know, when we move our arm, you know, the biceps flex and the triceps relaxes. In the stiff pers person syndrome, both of the muscles are contracting at the same time. And, uh, and it can be very painful. It's an invisible condition. And, uh, and oftentimes people go undiagnosed and, and, uh, and uh, on misunderstood because it's, it's hard to, to, uh, to understand. So you know, if, if you're noticing any changes, you, know, you are always uh, in charge for a neurology consult. And it can also cause diabetes and uh, because it can also attack the pancreas, and this can be uh, can present with or without cancer. Now, rapid cerebellar uh, progressive cerebellar syndrome. Essentially, the cerebellum is degrading uh, or it's been attacked by the immune system, and those cells that are very delicate they start to die. So it causes coordination difficulties, gait difficulties. People feel drunk without drinking, and uh, and. Sometimes it can also affect the brain stem, so swallowing difficulties can be an issue as well. Uh, there are some specific antibodies that have been uh, associated with most uh, commonly, but there are other antibodies that we have not detected, or sometimes there can be a cross reactivity from other antibodies. Obstructions, macronus, which I described, you know, these are uh, chaotic eye movement. And, you know, for, for this, um, sometimes they can have also like balance difficulties and coordination issues, and uh, and you know there's when it's paraneoplastic, it can in children can be associated with a neuroblastoma, in adults it can be associated with uh, small cell lung cancer or breast cancer. Uh, the anti-re antibodies are the most common ones that causes issues, 
and in young women it can it can be a sign of ovarian teratomas uh, with or without the the antibody or i'm sorry without the antibodies um, and sometimes it can be what we call idiopathic you know, it could be immune related post infectious or you know, nobody knows um, but you know needs needs treatment um, visual rehabilitation multiple medications uh, may help um, sometimes they need to paralyze some of the eye muscles surgically so the person can see one and things are not jumping it's sometimes it would just require that the person just tends to see around uh, but it can improve quality of life sensory neuropathy uh, it's very similar than peripheral neuropathy from cancer uh, except that sometimes it can involve motor uh, deficits as well uh, it is a diagnosis of exclusion so if there's no chemotherapy or radiation um, uh, associated nerve damage or any monoclonal gamma, monoclonal gammopathy as in some blood cancers, uh, any nutritional hormonal deficiencies or diabetes. Uh, if everything else has been exhausted, then it's quite probable that this is a, a, a one of these conditions. It could be exacerbated by immunotherapy and, uh, and keeping a, um, a high level of suspicion is important. Uh, if it is spinoplastic, you know, we may see some inflammatory changes in the spinal fluid, which is CSF, and it can also have more involvement. Uh, we need to have an EMG, which is a, a muscle test where uh, a needle gets to the muscle and, and records the muscle activity. It's, um, it's not a pleasant study, but it's necessary. Most people tolerate it fine, but it's better to be prepared. And some of the antibodies can be associated with it is anti-HIL and the CB2 and amphipycin, but it's not limited to those. Gastrointestinal pseudo obstruction. This, this um, condition can, can present as recurrent episodes of abdominal pain, distension, constipation, and with or without vomiting, and uh, without any true mechanical obstruction. Um, one of the tests that can be done for to diagnose this is a gastric emptying test and small bowel manometry, looking at the pressure in the small bowel. And when the you know, the bolus or the substance that make you swallow uh, is taking longer than to clear than expected, um, then they can make a diagnosis of gastroparesis. So here we see a normal uh, gastric emptying study. So it starts here, then it goes onto the esophagus, and then it stays in the stomach, the stomach, and then it goes to the bowel, and then it just keeps going. And here we see that it stays in the stomach two hours, and then they check again at four hours, and then it stays in there. And you know, so so it's so it's telling you that the the food or uh, anything that ingests it stays longer in the stomach or in the bowel, and it's not, um, you know the body's not reacting to push it down the line. Um, it can be very uncomfortable. So it's, you know, it can get better um, uh, with treatment by, you know, treating the cancer, remove uh, uh, steroids, sometimes if it is uh, um, due, to, due to autoimmune disease, autoimmune uh, complications for immunotherapy. If the person has an anti hu antibody, it can have a paraneoplastic origin. And, uh, and if the patient has an alpha acetylcholine receptor antibody, uh, it can be pre present with or without the cancer. So if things are really serious and literally your brain is on fire and uh, all the symptoms are rapidly progressing, uh, disabling and or a high risk of disability, uh, the the team, your team may admit you to the hospital. I mean, if you're seizing, you're gonna be in the hospital in ICU, uh, but the team may admit you to the hospital, massage steroids, if there's no response, they may filter your blood to remove all those antibodies that we suspect. Uh, if no response, they may give you something to, um, to neutralize some of those antibodies. And if there's no response, uh, then we, we uh, go for, uh, for more powerful medications, uh, rituximab or cyclophosphamide, depending on the um, uh, situation. Sometimes we can use uh, tocilizumab or anakinra that can also potentially help. But because most of these are uh, mediated by an antibody, 
the, the a very important situation is to remove as many antibodies as possible, reduce inflammation with the steroids, and uh, and you know, be aggressive. You know, sometimes if things don't get better within a few days, we just need to move to the next line. Um, and uh, or if things get worse, essentially. And then maintenance treatment you know, is planned with the uh, with your team. Um, so some of these uh, studies are are done depending on the situation. Some people may under you know, if, if a cancer is found at that time, they just go for surgery or biopsy and then start treating while the person is still recovering. So it's it's um it's like the black hole of neurology, but it's fascinating. Not every neuro neurologist will say so. Um, and for these type of syndromes, uh, we follow a holistic approach, you know, depending on the clinical presentation, the testing, the risk factors of each person, uh, the treatment response, uh, what is the potential disability, uh, what other concomitant issues uh, that the person may have, you know, physical, social, uh, uh, treatment-wise as well. Uh, it's important to know that not everybody will have all the uh, positive antibodies, and not all the antibodies mean cancer. So context is very, very important. And very importantly, recovery happens. Uh, it's important to have an expectation from the clinical team and you know, patient and family. You know, it's, it's a team effort. Uh, we need to make sure that the resources are available for recovery, therapies, uh, rehabilita cognitive rehabilitation, provide caregiver support, um, have an adequate follow-up plan after the hospital, and make sure that we have a maintenance of quality of life, which I'll talk a little more about it. Uh, we need to treat the, uh, the malignancy. If there's one, that's the root of the problem. If the, um, uh, you know, if we don't find the cancer at that time, we need to screen every six months to, uh, to make sure that we're not missing something. Sometimes it's that um, it's a blessing in disguise because it's a warning event, but you know, uh, but sometimes we just have to wait until like two to three years screening until we find something. Uh, if the patient, you know, we need to keep a maintenance chemotherapy to allow things to cool down, uh, even after we treat the cancer. And paraplastic syndromes can also be a massive recurrence. Uh, number infant syndrome is not. Uh, it's um, it's um, uh, it starts with like progressive muscle weakness in the arms and legs. Um, you know, it starts, it, you know, it's, it's a very interesting syndrome because people feel like weak to start movement, but as they move, they feel stronger and they get stronger. Even reflexes uh, get better. And uh, it can have dry mouth, there's some um, erectile dysfunction constipation. Uh, this is confirmed by an EMG, the muscle study. And uh, patients may have a, a PQ type, uh, voltage carry calcium channel antibody. Uh, in the majority of these syndromes, they're associated with cancer. Uh, there's also SOX1 antibodies that are associated with a small cell lung cancer. Peripheral neuropathy, um, you know, some of these, I'm not gonna go in, in depth because you already got a really good talk about it. And, uh, but in the setting of cancer, the most common cause is chemotherapy treatments. Uh, platinum base, uh, toxins, and mink alkaloids. Uh, sometimes it's dose dependent, sometimes it can be transient, sometimes it can be permanent, and sometimes it can have a coasting effect, meaning that months after stopping the treatment with one of these uh, with some of these medications, uh, you start having neuro you know, peripheral neuropathy. You know, usually within like six, three to six months after, uh, you know, these symptoms can start to. If that's the case with you, you know, always discuss it with your doctor to uh, to have a, a full workup and and find out the cause. Um, it can be aggravated by other conditions that can affect the, the small nerves. Uh, excess of vitamins uh, B6 or zinc without copper can uh, cause peripheral neuropathy. And, uh, and so, so we should not overdo it. Always, if you supplement, make sure that everything is approved by your team. And some supplements may help, I'll talk about it more. Now, moving on to survivorship. Uh, we have interventions for maintenance of, of function and quality of life. So this is you. And you are surrounded by, uh, um, by a lot of people and you have 
you, know, you may have at your disposal a lot of uh, resources that sometimes uh, we may not be aware of. And in order to keep you in the best status of health possible, you know, it may not be, we may not be able to get you back to where you were before. But if we can get you to like a really good place or the best place possible for as long as we can, uh, you know, it takes all these elements and maybe more uh, to get you back on track. So you know, it it has um, it involves your participation, your team participation, uh, and um, support groups, your friends, your family, uh, your religion if you practice a religion or just God. Uh, or meditation to to the universe, and um, and um, but most importantly, you know, this is for you, and and um, and you should you should make yourself the center of your of your care. Now, quality of life, it's a very personal uh, 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 description of what makes you happy, what is important for you. What is um, uh, you? What are your priorities in and in, you know, in terms of values and what what do you want in your life? It's also a dynamic process. Now, for some people, you know, their quality of life is uh, you know it involves like I you know they need to walk right, and uh, and the moment that they are unable to walk, you know they're you know they are not you know they they don't want you know that's something that like, is really lost. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, if they're unable to walk, they realize that okay, it's not as bad, you know, as long as I can see, right? So, uh, or for some people, quality of life is being able to spend time at home with their family, and uh, and avoid being in hospital for as long as possible. For some people, is to live as long as possible, no matter what the condition is, um, uh, even if you are not unable to say. Uh, something if you're connected to machine. So all these things are very different and things can change over time. So, but voicing what is important for you uh, allows us and allows your family and your team to to know what, how are we gonna focus on your care? What's our goal? And those goals can change and it's okay. You know, things are dynamic in this situation. And also it's very important to have, to try to have us, realistic expectations uh, it's not easy especially with this uh, uh, you know when one is diagnosed with cancer um, but if we get like small goals and you know we reach those goals we celebrate but you know we have like a okay an extra goal here so that helps uh, keeping you engaged as well and uh, and reduces the amount of frustration if you're not achieving this incredible goal you know uh, some people may have you know May may feel very debilitated. They may have a spinal cord tumor, and you know the goal is um, climb the Everest, and you know that may not may not happen, right? Uh, but but I think it's important to keep in to be as optimistic as possible, motivated as possible, but knowing that things may not go the way we want, and we need to be adapted to it. It takes a village, so you got a whole team here that. Um, that is supporting you and also your 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 family, your loved ones. Uh, things that you can do for yourself, right? To sleep well as much as you can. Depression management, it is okay to get help. Psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors can be of great help. Um, talking to family and friends is not all, I mean, it's amazing and I highly encourage it, but sometimes it does not allow you to truly open up because you don't want to burden them or worry them that you're feeling like that or make them feel that you're not appreciated uh, you're not appreciating their efforts um, or you don't want to scare them so it's easy to build in that those emotions so uh, depression management is very important also um, one thing that I recommend my patients is time crying so you set up your alarm you warm up your family and friends and people around you. I'm going to have my moment. So you put like three minute alarm, five minute alarm, whatever you need. You get yourself to, a, to an area uh, where you, you know, where it's private, you feel comfortable, grab a pillow and then just beat the pillow as hard as you have. Ah, cry, curse as much as you can. Everything that you know, gets your, all those emotions out that you're, that you're like, keeping in your heart all day long. Once that alarm goes off, Take a deep breath, 
couple times, wash your face, keep on with your day. And uh, and that should be, um, you know, that oftentimes helps you release some of those stress. Uh, you know, eating well, exercise and um, stand slow and steady and with consistency is key. And uh, and you ask, ask your therapist for homework. Um, integrative medicine with acupuncture, music therapy, pet therapy, so, social support is very good. Uh, here's a little extra um, tips on exercises. Uh, if your mobility is limited, your heart rate falls, you can do exercises in the chair. Uh, you can do energy con conservation techniques. And if you're watching TV, you can always do mini workouts in, during the commercial. So commercial goes up, you work the arms. Uh, the next the, uh, the next commercial break, do the legs. And uh, slowly you, uh, you start building up stamina. There are different medications that can help. Uh, Miracle Berry can enhance taste. Uh, Peripheral neuropathy can be uh, can be helped with medications, some ice chips if you're on oxaliplatin and carboplatin, heavy blanket at night. Uh, alpha lipoic acid can improve remarination in the nerves, but it takes months and the urine smells really bad. Uh, it can be also uh, upsetting to the stomach, so make sure that you discuss this with your doctors. Uh, Ampira uh, can help with energy and mobility, originally a medication for MS, but sometimes it can help with cancer patients. And the stimulants may help with attention and energy, but always talk to your doctors. Uh, neurocognitive rehabilitation. Uh, Rusk uh, has um, uh, an incredible re neuro re rehabilitation program. It focuses on different areas uh, difficulty with speech, a patient language, eye hand coordination, swallowing, vestibular and balance rehabilitation. And, uh, and neuropsychology, they do initial evaluation in person and then they can do the rehab either in person or online, which you know, is super helpful. Uh, they have locations in uh, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Long Island, and Florida for those snowbirds. Um, a great resource for at-home, self-paced rehabilitation, their apps. Uh, the Barrow Neuro, Neuro Rehabilitation Institute in Arizona, uh, they have an incredible program. And they're nice enough to share all the resources on their website. So this is just a little example of some of the apps that they recommend depending on the domain. Uh, here's the, the, the uh, code, but if you just type on Google Barrow Neuro Rehabilitation, it will just be the first thing on, on the Google list. Now, um, caregivers. Um, it's, it's very important that you take care of yourself because burnout is real. And this is you know, it, might, it doesn't feel related to the, um, to the um, survivorship in neuro-oncology or in neurological complications, but it does have a lot to do because when somebody cannot think clearly or walk safely or do the things that they used to do or be as independent because of cognitive impairment or um, weakness on one side, it takes a big toll on the family and, um, and burnout is real. So, you know, people become progressively overwhelmed to the breaking point. And there's a lot of guilt because, you know, how are you going to take a break? They need you. Uh, you know, they're, they're having a horrible time. How can I enjoy myself? But if you don't take care of yourself, at some point, you're not going to be able to take care of your loved one either. So it's okay to take a break. It's okay to accept family and friends support from the beginning. Because if you keep saying no, they're going to stop asking. And when you really need it, that you know, um, it's hard to say I need help, but but I'm sure they will be happy to do so. Um, stay social. Isolation is very frequent, and there's tons of caregiver support groups because they know what you're dealing with. Um, and social workers, uh, they have a lot of resources. So we have great support services at NYU. We have integrative health, nutrition, oncology rehab uh, groups, um, and counseling. Uh, 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 as well, supportive care and survivorship programs of all sorts. These are some of the links and numbers for the for NYU. And here are some of the links for you know that could be helpful as well. Goodrx.com is to save you money, decreasing that uh, stress in your mind. And um, you know NYU has incredible support. Uh, uh, the uh, National Cancer Society it also has great support, and Cancer Care has incredible links and support so it you know I, I encourage you to uh you know to you know go on this website and see if anything helps
it can last up to, up to six months. Uh, most people start like feeling better, you know, uh, six months and, and after. But sometimes it can linger a little bit longer. Uh, it also depends on what kind of uh, medication you're on. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, you know, some of those are notorious to cause cognitive uh, deficits while you're on the medication, and those can be disabling. And you know, after you stop it, you know, they get better. Um, but it it can take months sometimes. Uh, um, the, a lot of the symptoms from chemo brain. Uh, the more classic ones, it, they get better with with cognitive rehabilitation and coping strategies, and managing that depression expectations. You know, it's easy to beat yourself up. You're like I cannot remember anything, and just like um, uh, talk to yourself, talk to yourself negative. But, you know, just being patient to yourself and making sure that people around you understands that you know it's not easy. Um, um, but you know, it gets better. It does get better. So usually six months, sometimes a little longer, but you can make it a lot better with uh, rehabilitation and, um, and you know, the, the, the strategies that I mentioned earlier. I think the most important thing is that you, you know, the stronger you are at baseline um, before anything happens, the better chances uh, your body has to recover, the more brain reserve you have. So sleeping well, eating healthy, um, you know, just Managing as uh, as many things that are in your in your hands, you know, with uh, exercise is very important. And um, and you know, if you feel that you're not thinking quite right, you can always do you know, keeping your brain active with apps or uh, you know, some rehabilitation. Managing depression is super important. Uh, but you know, there's nothing that can prevent things. It's just you know, having a good maintaining a good baseline as much as possible. So if anything happens, you're stronger on the fight. Yes, uh, the answer is uh, is yes. And it could be the first sign that cancer is about to declare itself again. Um, if it is triggered by immunotherapy, that might not be the case because it might just be that the immune system is overly stimulated and just getting confused and creating antibodies like crazy. Uh, but if you're not on an immunotherapy or you're stable in immunotherapy and you know, um, uh, you know this, you, you develop a, a, a panoplastic syndrome, uh, you know, a much closer, closer surveillance needs to be kept uh, to detect anything at the earliest sign of recurrence and, and nip it at the bar. So it's kind of a blessing in disguise. It's a warning. If there are new symptoms that are progress like neurological symptoms like headaches, double vision, numbness, stimulating sensation, uh, walking difficulties, thinking uh, ability or periods of confusion, something unusual that um, that is that just you know it's, it's hard to explain, but it's kind of getting worse or you know slowly progressing, um, and that you know that is just kind of insidious or you know your family notices something off. Uh, you know, that's when you can ask your doctor to, to you know, to see if they can refer you to a neurologist, and then the neurologist will, can run a specific tests depending on the symptoms that you may have. Well, in some cases, yes, um, yes and no. So, some people can can. There's some studies that are being done right now uh, on starting duloxetine uh, at the same time as medications that we know are are offensive to the peripheral nerves like uh, carboplatin, oxaliplatin especially, and uh, and or you know, other chemotherapies that are like poison to the tumor, but also for your nerves. And starting it early uh, may help prevent some of the uh, some of the symptoms or the severity of it, but it's not confirmed yet uh, scientifically. But there are trials based on that empirical experience. Um, and uh, the other technique that can help, especially in in uh, in some of these uh, taxing um, based therapies or carboplatin too, is um, having ice chips in the mouth and also having like cold gloves in your hands. And if you can tolerate in the in the feet, or just like hold like a, uh, like two bottles of water, like really really cold during the infusion, and that's supposed to help. Uh, reducing the incidence and severity of the 
uh, of the peripheral neuropathy. It's, it's still, you know, there's like some early trials on that, uh, but it's an easy, cheap technique that you can try and see if that helps. Um, you know, for neuropathy, you know, most of the time is symptomatic management. Um, there's a, a acupuncture, there's some Ladokine patches, and um, I would refer to uh, 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 Dr. Monique's Mercado, Mercado's lecture on, on chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, because she shares a great deal of uh, strategies on how to cope with it. Um, uh, sometimes these symptoms are permanent, and uh, sometimes they get better with steroids if, if treated uh, on time, but there might be some permanent nerve damage. Alpha lipoic acid can help rebuild some of that um, insulation around the nerves. It's called myelin that can help repair some of those nerves, but it takes months to years. Um, you know, having a, a, a good neurologist or a special a, a neuropalliative care specialist can get, get uh, significant help for you. Uh, opioids don't help really for this kind of symptom. Uh, it's more like things that reduce that nerve irritation.